Uh, good morning, and thank you all for coming. Um, glad to see so many of you made it. And hopefully, somebody will find my jokes funny. <laughs> uh, as Kevin said, uh, yeah, I've been with Calgary Peacemakers almost from the beginning. I think August or so, four years ago, he and my uncle started going out on the streets together. And uh, I joined up sometime in September of that year. Um, I was <laughs> admittedly somewhat of a skeptic when I first came out. I, I sort of came to prove everybody wrong, that they were <clears throat> doing evangelism wrong, and well, I quickly ate my words. <laughs> I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, just a little bit about me. I, I'm a member of Redeemer Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Arabi. Probably as a Presbyterian, that's numbered in the room. You're, you're allowed to laugh at that. <laughs> um, I had somebody ask me a while back, so other, other than uh, infant death, baptism, is your church an okay church? I'm like, well, what kind of a question is that? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've been a member of that church for a couple of years now. Um, and shortly after, I guess it was maybe six months after I joined Calgary Peacemakers, um, searching the word from that church. And then uh, a year and a half ago, a little more than a year and a half ago, Melissa and I got married, and uh, had a baby on the way. He's right there, grinning at me, <laughs> holding him to the chair. He's like, Dad, <laughs> don't make everybody look at me. But anyway, that's basically, there's not a lot to tell about me. Um, I've, I've been preaching with Kevin for, for those four years. Uh, and it, God has been very gracious to us in our journey along the way, learning. Uh, I look back at where we were when we first started out and how ignorant we were. Uh, it, it's amazing over time the, the amount of knowledge that we've gained to realize you know, how, how kind God is that we haven't really made a mess of things along the way. Um, what Kevin asked me to speak on this morning was our, our view of the church and how we relate to the church as a ministry and, and how evangelism is to be done in the local church and how we are to be a part of that. Uh, the story basically starts that you know, when we began as a ministry or as a group, um, I, I really remember that one of the things we would always tell people is we're not here representing a church, we're not here to get you to go to church, we're just preaching the gospel. And over the years we've come to realize that that's sort of a false paradigm because Christ calls people to himself and to his body. And so what I want to look at today is a passage of scripture and from that passage of scripture look at how our view of the church and how the church is supposed to relate to people who do evangelism and how people who do evangelism are supposed to relate to the church in, in uh, practicality. Uh, but mainly I want to look at what God has said about his people and how he calls them to himself in the church. And he calls them then to proclaim himself to the world. So if you turn with me in your Bibles, I'd like to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. <coughs> and I'm going to read from verse 5. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Now I wanted to um, look at this passage in, in three sections. Uh, first of all, if Kevin had given me a chance to give this message a title, I would have probably called it, There's Something Special About the Church, and I want to focus on that, that there is something entirely unique about the church, it's set apart, there is no other organization or organism on earth given by God to men that is like the church. There is, there is a, a distinction, a separation between the church and every other human organization because the church belongs to God and only the church has Jesus Christ as its king and head. So the first way in which I want to look at this is uh, the one who has called you out of darkness. And then I want to look at you who are called and finally at, at proclaiming the excellencies of Christ. Now, when I was preparing, I, I wrote my notes through several times, and the first couple of times I began just simply looking at the church and those who are called by God, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Um, but by the time I got through to the third rewriting, I realized that I was beginning in the wrong spot. Uh, it's, it's easy to forget the one who has called us. It's easy to forget God and His importance, even though we are God's people, we often get ourselves up, or our eyes on ourselves and off of God. And it is only because that Jesus is the chosen Savior that we can be a chosen race. It is only because that Jesus is the royal priest that we can be a royal priesthood. It is only because He is the King of holiness and righteousness that we can be a holy nation. It is only because He has called us and made us His own and redeemed us that we can be a people for His own possession. And therefore, only because of those things that we might, may proclaim His excellencies. My pastor has this, um, this phrase that he likes to remind us not to be Reformed deists. Uh, it's easy to forget. Forget God and, uh, you know, we have... In the Bible, we have very clear instructions of what God has called us to do. We have a lot of the knowledge of God. God has revealed Himself to us marvelously. But it's easy to forget the living and true God and live as if He has just given us rules to follow and left us to do it on our own. And so that's why I want to look first at the one who has called us. First of all, let's look at how Jesus is the chosen Savior. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 7. I'm going to start at verse 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. God did not offer desire the blood of bulls and goats for the redemption of his people and therefore he gave his only son. 1 John 4.14 4, says the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. And when Jesus was baptized, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and the Holy Spirit descended on him and remained. And so we see in scripture that God has chosen Jesus the Christ, the God-man, to be the savior of his people. In fact, he commanded Mary and Joseph to name him Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. But I want us to remember that this 
you know, as in, in Matthew, when, when we see Jesus baptized and the Father speaks from heaven and the Son is baptized and the Holy Spirit descends on the Son, that this choosing of Jesus as the Savior, the sending of the Savior is an act of the triune God. And we can easily forget that God, God in his unity is pleased to send a Savior. It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom through his only Son. And God chose before eternity, before time, to send his only Son in the person of Jesus Christ. Next, let's look at Jesus as the royal priest and turn over a few pages to Hebrews chapter 8. I'm going to start with verse, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this, that we have such a high priest who is the one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant that he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish the new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them out of Egypt, to, uh, took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no mercy, or showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their transgressions no more. And so we see in this passage that Jesus, as the high priest, brings a, a better covenant, a covenant enacted on better promises that the, the blood of bulls and goats was merely a foreshadowing. But Jesus, as the royal priest, the priest king, not like the sons of Aaron who offered gifts according to the law, but according to his grace, Jesus, the Son of God, offers his own blood as a priest. I want to look also at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 14. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but my, by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of de defiled per persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So we see this royal priest after the order of Melchizedek who, was, who blessed Abraham who was not of the seed of Aaron. We see Christ and him having offered his own blood. Just as it is, it is important that it is an act of the triune God to choose to ordain to send Jesus it is an act of the triune God since he offered himself 
through the eternal spirit to God, that he might purify us from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus has secured access to God through his flesh, through a greater and more perfect tent. And he has made a way through his flesh, which is the veil. He is torn, the veil was torn in two, and through the tearing of the veil, Christ has made a way into the most holy place. He has secured an eternal and perfect redemption by his perfect obedience and by his perfect suffering and death. And in this way, he is the perfect high priest, able to mediate for those who have sinned. Finally, I want to look at Jesus, the King of Holiness. If you will turn with me to Psalm chapter 2. Getting a little exercise for the fingers this morning. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And we see in this passage, as David foretells the Son of God, who would ru rule over his people, the King of Holiness. And not only does he rule over the nations of the world as sovereign God and creator, but he rules in a special way, a saving way, over his church, over his people. It says, blessed are those who take refuge in him. Blessed are those who take refuge in the king of righteousness whom God has set on his holy hill, Zion. Not Sinai, not the place of the law, but Zion, the place of God's fellowship and blessing and grace with his people. The place where God commanded that his name would be there so his people could approach and receive grace and mercy. So God has set his son, Jesus, on Zion to mediate the covenant of grace. And it says, blessed are all those who take refuge in this king of holiness, that he might reign over them in righteousness. And the Bible says that God gave Jesus, the risen Christ, as king and head of the church. There is also a solemn warning in this, that those who rebel against the rule of Christ he will crush them. It says, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Those who do not come to him, those who do not submit to him, they will perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But for we who have come to Christ, for we who are made members of his body, who are chosen in Christ, he rules over us in salvation. And as the Heidelberg Catechism says, God ordains all things so that not even a hair can fall from my head apart from his will. And all things must work together for my salvation. Incidentally, that comes from scripture as well. And so thus we see the one who has called us, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has chosen Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to add to himself a human nature, to descend as the chosen Savior, 
to minister as the royal priest, the son of David, and to rule as the king of holiness on the throne of his father David forever and ever over the church and over the nations. So then let us turn our attention to those whom Christ has called. We are chosen in Christ as a body. And this is where we get to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And I want us to look at this in the context not of individuals being individually called, though individuals are called by God, but they are called to the church. And all the, the scriptures that I'm going to lay before you and, and reference today are letters are from letters to the church, to the churches. And the point in what I'm saying is here that we have been called to Christ. And when Jesus calls the elect to himself, there, there is one Lord and one Savior. And there is one body. We are called to be united to Christ by faith. And in being united to Jesus, we are united to each other. So it is a dangerous fallacy to say that I can be a Christian by myself. I don't need the church. I don't need anything. And particularly when it comes to evangelism to say I don't need the church. It's an exceedingly dangerous thing. And as an aside, I've seen many people who thought they were too good for the church. Evangelists, people that went out to supposedly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I have seen many of them fall into heresy and error and reject the gospel entirely because they thought they were too good for the church, that the church was not pure enough for them. So this comes with a, a, a dangerous warning. Just like Psalm 2 said, those who do not submit to Christ will perish in the way. And part of submitting to Christ is not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as Hebrews says. Such is the manner of some. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. There's a couple of past, uh, verses in this chapter that I'd like to briefly look at. Verse 12 to 14 to begin with. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of one body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews, and Greek, or Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. And a little later, verse 27 now you, are, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And finally, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And so we see from God's word that God intends for Christians to be individually members of the one body of Christ. And as I said, Jesus calls the elect to himself and unites them in one body in himself so that there is no longer Jew or Greek or slave or free, Canadian, American. There, are, there is one body in Christ. And so we are a chosen people. We are not members of different nations, even though we hold citizenship in different nations around the world. We are now members of Christ, first and foremost. We are members of his body, and in that respect, together, all the nations of the earth will be blessed as they will be the chosen people of Christ, called into one body. Romans 1, the greeting, Paul says, to those who are loved by God and called to be saints. And that was written to the church. 
Paul refers to the church as those who are loved by God and called to be saints. Secondly, we have access to the throne in Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the great high priest who entered before us into the most holy place, we have access to the throne in Christ. Ephesians 2 speaks of the church being founded upon the apostles and the prophets. And we have access to the throne of God through the word of God, written by the apostles and prophets, and through prayer. God speaks to us through his word, and we speak to God in prayer. And we understand these things to be the way in which Christ communicates to us the benefits of his redemption. For Paul says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they uh, call upon him in whom they do not believe. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Finally, we have, as a, as a holy nation, we have the office of being ambassadors for the king. Because we are united to Christ by faith and now a possession of Christ, he sends us out as our passage before us today says, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I just want to read one more passage from 2 Corinthians before we move on to talking about how the church and how we proclaim the excellencies of Christ. Second Corinthians five. Verse seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal, you, appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So we see that the Christ who has called us to himself, to his body, then gives us as the church, and that's important, as the church, he gives the church the ministry of reconciliation, which is the gospel. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. That was a reminder on my phone saying I'm supposed to be street preaching. <laughs> well, this isn't exactly a street. <laughs> so then, how does the church proclaim his excellencies? First of all, who does the church proclaim? Obviously, the church proclaims Christ the chosen savior, the royal priest, the holy king, we do not proclaim ourselves. The scripture says there is salvation in no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. And we must take that to heart, that there is no salvation in my name or yours either. And so we do not proclaim ourselves, but Christ crucified. And if the church, or if any of us, are about proclaiming ourselves, or pet projects, or anything but the gospel of Jesus Christ and the whole counsel of God and his word, we have missed the point and we are no longer proclaiming his excellencies, but our own deficiencies. Secondly, the church proclaims him first 
to the ordinary ministry of the church. God has ordained pastors and teachers and elders that the main ways in which God communicates to us the benefits of redemption, the preaching of the word and the reading of the word and baptism in the Lord's Supper might be rightly, rightly preached, rightly uh, performed, uh, that God's people might be encouraged and strengthened in the faith, that faith might be created in the unbeliever, and that the Lord our God might call all those whom he has chosen to himself. So primarily the church proclaims Christ in the ministry of the word. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 details how God gave those ministers and those offices to build up the body of Christ for the work of ministry. And we also see we see the person and the work of Jesus Christ proclaimed in all his excellencies through the ministry of the word and through the sacraments or ordinances. We also see his common grace and his kindness through the ministry of mercy. And we ought not to forget that both go hand in hand because there are to be pastors and elders and deacons in the church. For our God is kind to all men. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. And he means for us to care for one another in a body. So we proclaim Christ, not only in the preaching of the word on Sunday morning, and in the ministry of the pastors and elders, but in the ministry of the deacons and people serving each other. And also there is the ministry of ordinary believers, which is in essence an imitation of the elders and deacons. For if we are called to share the gospel with our neighbors, to minister to our neighbors, what have we but the gospel that is being preached every Sunday, at least that we hope is being preached every Sunday. We are to spread the knowledge of Christ as a fragrance. Now this takes place in, in many ways. And the primary way in which the spreading of Christ is a fragrance, the knowledge of Christ is a fragrance, takes place is in the witness of ordinary life. There are people that we will never see on the street. Never, you know, there are people that are private that do not go to where there are many people. And they are often reached through the ministry of believers who work with them at a job, who sit beside them at the next desk what have you, go to school with them. And so we are called, everyone is called to the extent that they are able to be a witness to Christ, to their neighbor, to those whom they rub shoulders with in everyday life. And we should not forget this because there are many people that street preaching won't reach because they simply will not be in a place to hear it. There are many examples in scripture of people going and telling their neighbor. But this is not the only method of evangelism that Christ has ordained for his church. We are also to intentionally go and find people. And as Kevin referenced, to compel them to come in go out to the highways and the hedges to preach the good news of Christ, to herald it wherever it may be heard. But we are also to be intentional in the home as fathers, to preach the gospel to our families, to train up our children in the way that they should go. Practically speaking, I just want to think of some church functions that can be evangelism. I mean, there are, uh, one of our brothers was, as we were praying earlier, was thanking God for the, for the ladies that were making the food for this afternoon. Um, and there are many ways in which God calls us to be of service to the church in evangelism uh, as, as helpers to those who actually preach the message. And God calls us to do evangelism as a church, as church bodies, to 
go out together, whether it be door to door, whether it be uh, our our church uh, has started doing a barbecue and a in the in the park in the middle of town. We we go out and we advertise that we're having a barbecue and it's an invitation for people to come and there's a sermon preached by our pastor there are tracts given out uh, and there's delicious food served that usually gets people to come Scotsmen anyway we Scotsmen are all about our stomachs <clears throat> it's okay to laugh at that too I'm a Scotsman <laughs> um, and for certain, you know, things, I, I like to say, I like, you know, my pastor and I have discussed this, that when it comes to evangelism, you can be creative. As long as you have the message of the gospel, um, you can be creative, whether it's having a barbecue and getting people to come so that they will hear the word. Uh, as long as Christ is proclaimed, you know, we should use our imaginations in, in witnessing um, and, and going out on the streets. I think we uh, often people do underestimate the value of standing on the street corner and preaching because just as there are people that will never hear the preaching of the word on the street corner because they don't go out much where there are people that gather and therefore are preachers there there are people that will never come to a church, that don't have Christian coworkers, that don't have Christian friends. We actually live in a society where there are people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ except for a curse word. And that brings to mind the necessity of evangelism because we serve God in a perishing world. Because God has promised that you know, he says in Psalm 2, Kiss the son lest he be angry, for his wrath is quickly kindled. And so we go as heralds uh, to counsel people to be reconciled to God. We are to plead with them in, in any way possible, find any way that we can to get the message out, the message of the gospel, you know, by the preaching, proclaiming of the word of God. But the highly important thing is that we do not, as evangelists, say to the church, I have no need of you. To say to the rest of the body, I'm going to cut myself off from you because I'm all about evangelism and you don't seem to care, so I'm just going to cut myself off from you. It's almost as insane as going to the doctor to get a liver transplant and saying, excuse me, doctor, can you just put it in a plastic bag for me and I'll take it home? I don't really want to have it in my body. I'm just going to keep it severed forever. And that's what having Christians severed from the body of Christ is like. It's insane and it brings death. Especially when we try and evangelize without the church, when we try and proclaim Christ without proclaiming the body to whom Christ has called all believers, we, we run a serious risk of cutting ourselves off from Christ, saying, I don't need to be part of the body of Christ. Well, it looks like we're coming to the end of our time, so I would just like to go if you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses 
according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Brothers and sisters, we have been called in Christ to be a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession, that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. For God has given us mercy in calling us to himself and to his body, the church. Indeed, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your beloved Son, whom you have sent to be the Savior of the world. Lord, it is written that you have sworn and will not change your mind that your Son is a priest forever. And so we draw near to you through him, knowing that you will receive us because of his blood and his righteousness, our great high priest. Lord, we pray that the words spoken here today, uh, that those that are true, that you would use them by your spirit to be a blessing. Lord, that those that are in error would be falling on deaf ears, that they would be ignored. Lord, use your word to communicate to your people the blessings of Christ, that we may receive your word by faith, that we may receive Christ by faith. Lord, bless us in this day as we continue to hear from your word. Help us to heed it, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>